can I begin by acknowledging that we are here on the traditional lands of the Boon Wurrung and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And we acknowledge elders past and present and elders from any other communities who are joining us tonight. And welcome to this MIF talk, which is presented by The Age. Long live independent journalism, may it continue <laughs> in these troubled times. Um, we are here to talk about sex um, on screen, and particularly sex as a means of telling story, um, whether it's erotic or um, sweet or sinister. Um, it can be a way of exploring conflict, power dynamic, a way to reveal character or explore questions of identity and boundaries. There's so much we could cover in this very short hour, but um, the uniting theme, I guess, is about intimacy, um, authenticity, <laughs> authenticity, authenticity of intimacy. So we have got a fabulous panel here to talk about that tonight, um, starting with the um, magnificent Tony Ayres, who has a very long history with Melbourne International Film Festival, and it's hard to even run through his credits, there's so many, but um, starting maybe with Home Song Stories, was that a MIF film? Uh, yes, I think so. I think yep. it was. Um, and, um, and obviously responsible for amazing series like Nowhere Boys and The Slap. Um, we then have Miranda Nation, whose um, feature debut, Undertow, screened twice in the past week to acclaim, um, and she's also an uh, Accelerator alumni. Then we have Thomas M. Wright, who also premiered his fabulous film um, at, um, at uh, uh, last Saturday night, I think. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Saturday. Yeah. yeah. And um, also to acclaim, and in fact, you even picked up the um, MIF. The, um, the Age Writers' Prize, well done. The Age Critics' Prize, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. it. And also, and I think we've seen you before at MIF as an actor on screen in Balibo and... Um, Top of the Lake. Top I of think. the Lake yeah. and yeah. Van Diemen's Land maybe as well. Maybe. And then we have our <laughs> MIF ambassador, Sarah Snook. And um, Sarah's appeared in some shorts, but I remember you as um, opening of... Um, with um, Predestination, oh, yeah. which was opening night a few years ago, which is such an amazing film, so... Awesome to have such a great panel, and let's get into the discussion. Um, Tony, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> <laughs> this is your favourite topic, I know. Um, so, uh, the Hollywood cinema obviously has a certain um, reputation in terms of the way it conveys sex on screen and intimacy. International cinema has a very different um, reputation. Is there an Australian sensibility when it comes to depicting sex on screen? Um, the one word I would use is awkward. Awkward. <laughs> I think many people in the room can relate to that. There are many filmmakers here tonight. Yeah. I think that uh, there is a, a kind of Australian sensibility which is trying to go for something real. And I think we're, we're caught in between the, um, the candy gloss of American cinema uh, sex, which is basically four shots, basically pretty much the same four shots in virtually every film, and uh, the, the kind of graphic reality of European cinema sex. And I often think of uh, my favourite sex scenes in Australian movies, like uh, Praise, for instance. I thought this, the sex scenes in Praise were phenomenal, but they were kind of awkward. They, they were real, and they talk about the the difficulty of sex more than uh, often more than the pleasure of sex. So there was intentionally awkward sex in that oh, yeah, case, yeah, yeah, but there's yeah, also yeah. there's unintentionally awkward sex on screen too, <laughs> isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Thomas, how comfortable do you think Australian audiences are with sex on screen, and what would you like to be seeing more of? Uh, look, I, I think I can probably speak to that by talking also about something that you know I've really appreciated in Australian cinema. I, when I was thinking about this panel, I was sort of thinking, were there any particular scenes in films that I thought, that's right, that's kind of the way that something like this should be handled. And I think um, Amiel Court and Wilson made a film in, I think, it must be about 2011, called Hail. And the film concerns a crim in his 50s, Danny Jones, and the film's based on his life story and features him and his real partner, whose name's Leanne Lech. And at the very beginning of the film, 
Danny is let out of jail, presumably after being in there for a fairly long period of time, and he's reunited in the backyard with Leanne, and they kind of jump up and embrace each other. They go into the house, and she takes him around, and they're sort of talking about what's changed and what's not changed. And then there's this most astonishing sex scene. It's probably my favourite sex scene almost in the history of cinema because it's so intimate, um, it's so simple, it's so essential to the film, to what's happening, to understanding this relationship and to grounding it in this kind of very intimate reality of connection that's happening between these two people. Um, I'm sure it's real sex. The camera is very intimately sort of in there with them, but it's not graphic at all. And these are older people who've led very, very hard lives with drug addiction and alcoholism and that sort of thing. And the thing that struck me about it is I thought that in American cinema, the only reason you would ever see these two people having sex was either for shock value or for comedy. And that's so demeaning. And um, I just thought that the, the intimacy and the, the sense of connection and the sense that you were being allowed into this kind of privileged moment in this relationship and this very physical form of communication... Um, Yes, yeah, so that's the kind of thing that I would probably advocate for seeing more of, is sex that doesn't reduce sex to a visual idea that's both essential to narrative and also revealing of, um, of people and that kind of transcends the boundaries between people. Mm. So I see you nodding your head there, Sarah. Snoop. Well, yeah, I, I, I feel like so often sex gets uh, glossed over in... Uh, we were talking about this earlier about um, that it becomes a montage, that you go... You get all the foreplay stuff of the dialogue and the, the banter and then the kiss and then it's, oh, we all know they're about to have sex, so quickly let's see some shots of feet and we'll do those four <laughs> shots that yeah. um, most people do in a... What are the four film. shots, too? Yeah. What, was, what are the four shots? The side boob. Right. <laughs> the <laughs> you know. side boob. <laughs> Most often focused on the woman, the woman's face yeah, because yeah, yeah, some yeah. reason we don't want to see men's faces in sex. Um, <laughs> or, penises. How, or penises. <laughs> I don't know how that started. Maybe there's some sort of male domination, heterosexual kind of thing going on. Um, but, but it's never really used as a project, like a uh, pushing forward or a progression of narrative. And For that, sure. I think, is really lacking. I mean, what, that's the most intimate moment that either of these characters are ever going to have, whether it's consensual or not. And, and that is the most telling moment a person can give to another. So why wouldn't you want to share what that is for those two people in that moment with an audience. There's, there's one thing I just wanted to mention, which is probably my favourite international example, and it's because I, I appreciate narrative film. That's why I enjoy film, because I think to approach narrative and to approach it in diverse ways is what you want to do. And, and there's an Ang Lee film called Lust Caution, mm. where the entire... I mean, the title says it all, but the, but the, but the narrative is between a, a woman who's trying to infiltrate, um, you know, a, a kind of political situation and and is placed there to seduce and have sex with this incredibly violent kind of guy and the story is told through through the the sex that happens between these people and it's the engine of the story mm. and um and it's uh, it's incredibly compelling horrible ending to that film but but <laughs> great sex um follow up <laughs> question to sarah so when you you're often reading new scripts Mm -hmm. How is it when you come across a sex screen, what's, what goes through your mind? What, what sort of tests are you subjecting it to? I mean, yeah, I, when reading a, a script and you find that there's a sex scene in it, for the most part I tend to wonder how it's going to be shot, how it is written in the script, if it is glossed over because the writer feels uncomfortable writing that kind of material. Uh, I look at what the director who is attached, if they're attached already, what they have shot already, if they have shot a sex scene, uh, what their taste is for the style of sex scene or the style of films they've created before. Um, because it is, it's a very vulnerable thing for any human being, but then as an actor you have to go and do it in front of other people and it's a very strange, unsexy thing to do, <laughs> really, in, in front of like a room of people. Uh, so, you know, reading material like that, that's... The, I, and is it progressing the narrative? Awesome. Miranda, um, you created a really interesting um, lens of, of your character and her inner world. Um, and you worked with a pretty fabulous DP, Bonnie Elliott. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit about wanting to um, bring a, a feminine gay, a female gaze to the project. Can, what does that mean? And, and what did that involve? What discussions did you guys have? Well, I suppose the, the film 
deals a lot with the body and our relationships with our bodies and our sexuality. So it seemed really important that nudity and sex was a part of that story. There's actually three sex scenes in the film and each of them, I hope, really progresses the narrative and tells us something about the characters. Um, Bonnie and I talked a lot about... We did talk about the concept of the female gaze and what that meant to us was, um, you know, never having a sex scene that was for a gratuitous reason or um, objectifying the characters or, or their physicality. So always something that progressed the narrative and um, told us something about the characters and, also, and, and an authentic gaze on the body. So how the characters are seeing their own bodies rather than, you know, the kind of the theorised male gaze, which is inviting the viewer to be from the perspective of the, of the often male protagonist um, and having the woman as a, a thing to be looked at or a thing to be desired. In our case, we really wanted to show uh, the way that the woman was seeing her own body and, yeah. So. so is it possible that the whole solution to this history of the male gaze is really just approaching filmmaking with a sense of empathy for your characters? <laughs> if so, solved. Yeah. <laughs> It's complex, isn't it? Because, yeah. because we're actually talking about the way that we learn about sex too. We actually come to learn a lot about sex from the cinema that we see. We receive a lot of shit, obviously. Yeah. We're, we're actually, in, in fact, I think actually kind of fed lies. Um, and it's actually the responsibility of the individual to find what the actual truth is and find that through their relationships. But that negotiation is incredibly difficult because we've just been taught... It's sex is two beautiful people looking at each other and a third eye in the room. <laughs> and coming at the same the time. Fucking thing. What's that? <laughs> and coming at the same and time. And coming at the same time. <laughs> no, also, I have... And also the one where they're like, there's no mess. It's like, ah, rolled over. Well, that was good. What's the woman doing? What's she cleaning up? Like, what's the, like... Come on, let's, what are the details of the practicalities of yeah. sex? And that is completely glossed over. Yeah, absolutely. So true. So it's true. ridiculous. <laughs> Tony, tell me, what do you think, uh, what is authentic sex on screen and, and how do you achieve it and how hard is that? I mean, I mean I, sex is a dilemma for me as a director because, like, most of the time my work as a director is to try to be the first audience for the actors and to feel what the story needs me to feel at a particular moment. And so if you're directing a sex scene and this the story needs you to feel aroused, you know, it just doesn't feel right. It feels very, you know, awkward, that word I keep coming back to. Yeah. So, 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 and the thing is, sex, you know, most of the time when we make things, we're trying to get to something authentic. We're trying to get to something real. And two things as an audience we know are not real are sex and death on screen. Because, you know, unless it's porn, you kind of know it's not real. It's, 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 and then when you, and yet we're so graphic about death on screen, you can see it in so many ways, and yet we're often incredibly coy about sex on screen. And so, and, and you know, and, and that can be appropriate or not appropriate, but, but so, so, you know, I, I think there's a contradiction in, in the way that sex works on screen, which I haven't quite got my head around yet. Um, I guess I would say, as a director, for me, the sex scene has to be consensual. It has to be a collaboration with the actors. And it has to be, I mean, to be honest, the best sex scene I ever directed, I, I, basic, I mean, basically the actors told me what they felt comfortable with, what they wanted to do, and uh, what their limits were. And, and, I, you know, and I turned the camera on and I sort of said, yes, that tells me what I need to know. And that worked, it worked really well for me, you know, like it, and I don't think that, I think, you know, you, you can, if you do it any other way, it gets a bit, it feels like non-consensual sex. You know, if you try to push actors beyond what their comfort levels are, it's another way of harassing people. It's interesting, because actually it's interesting that you mentioned sex and death, I think also violence is an extension of that. And mm -hmm. as an actor, when you go to enact violence, you're not actually thinking, yeah, I'm going to fuck this person up. You know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, here we go. Mm. You, all it is is about safety. Yeah. You, you, draw, you draw a line and it doesn't matter who you are. And if you break that line, you know, you're just a 
fucking asshole, just <laughs> like you would be in real life. It's like you're there to look after each other. And also, I think you should be actively turning it into a joke, personally. I've had to shoot so much sex scenes, just ridiculous amounts of sex scenes. And Top of the Lake was just me and Elizabeth Moss nude for about a month and a half. <laughs> and there are a lot of sex scenes that aren't in that series. There's about three more because Jane just wanted to tell the story through sex to the point that it became kind of... There was a comic sort of sex scene where we were drinking Gatorade and the implication was we'd, we'd been having sex for, like, hours. <laughs> and, and, you know, we just mucked around we just laughed and looked after each other and turned it into a joke because um i think that's kind of what you owe to each other so thomas what sort of conversations did you have with jane in preparation for that particular role um oh yeah how to be sexy that was pretty horrible really (laughs) i don't feel comfortable being sexy at all i think you know like we always talk about because i had to do a lot of nudity and that sort of thing on Oh, I mean, I'm sort of joking when I say that, but, you know, I've had to do a lot of nudity on stage and that sort of thing as well. Um, and um, it's very easy to be funny and naked and it's very easy to be ugly and interesting and naked. It's very hard to be beautiful and naked and I think that's the unrealistic and kind of obscene thing that gets pushed onto women uh, in film a lot as well. That That's the most confronting as well for an audience to be presented with beautiful and naked, particularly on, on stage in the theatre, be- and it's utterly distracting. Like, I've never seen a, a, a stage show that involved nudity where the person was beautiful and naked and sexy or being that or trying to be that and I listened to any of the dialogue. Because, <laughs> because you're like, whoa. Whoa, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> Why, I wish I could, I could do that. And instead, you know, if, if, but the, the times that I've seen... Uh, there's a Stephen Sewell film, not a play, but he is a playwright. I can't remember the name of the film. It was like three years ago, four years ago. It's called... Um, it's two, uh, two-handed. Embedded. Yes, embedded. And they're nude for a lot of it, a lot of it. And they're very beautiful people, but they, the nudity in it is, is secondary to the battle of their minds. And they're in the shower, you know, showering, just... In, the nudity is almost incidental. They're husband and wife in real life. You know? Really? Yeah. Well, that's, that shows then, because they were so comfortable and it was thrilling. It was, like, really engaging to watch... The film, and I felt it dealt with nudity and with sex in one of the better ways that I've seen Australian cinema deal with it, because mm. it was about the engagement of the mind rather than to make it beautiful somehow. And they were just and I really think comfortable. With, just to return to your question about Jane too, I think with Jane it was really just about you know sex is communication. It's just another yeah. form of communication. It's an incredible form of communication, you know, in terms of what it's capable of in every direction. But um, you know, it was really about you know, who are these people, how do they relate to one another and how do we bring, bring their ev- all, all the intimate details of their relationship and the kind of engine that it is for this series and, and tell it through the sex that's in the film, in the series. So, Thomas, having had that experience as an actor, you came to direct your feature, Acute yeah. Misfortune. How did that inform your process? What was your, what was your process with the actors? Because oh, you had I, nudity I just, and just you had sex. I just want to add this to... to the question that went to Tony before is that as a filmmaker, um, you know, there's a huge process involved in this too about talking with the actors, even bringing them on. Thank you. And talking uh, and and negotiating the contracts. Yeah, even. You've got, what, you've got to negotiate nudity clauses. That's right. And so, and so then you have to establish that very early on with the actors about how are you going to be covering this and how are you going to be looking after them and that sort of thing. And then, you know, look, I think it just made me probably more comfortable with it, the fact that I've, that I've, the fact that I've done it so much. I was also directing two men, and I'm not gay, and I didn't have much experience of that sort of sex, but I had a very clear directive from my co-writer, who it's depicting in the film, that, 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 that he felt that there was a sex that he'd engaged with a lot in his life that he didn't see represented on film and he wanted to see that. And the interesting thing for us was to go very deep into a moment of intimacy and a moment of connection and a revelation about the character and introducing sexuality into the film, which um, I you know, can firmly say that Adam Cullen would have hated and good that it's in the film um, because the, the film needed to deal with that aspect um, needed to deal with that aspect of the character and their life and their perspective and what they were bringing to this um, to this relationship and yeah we just tried to make it as 
try to make it as enjoyable an experience as possible for them. Miranda, you've also been an actor. Mm. How did you approach um, the sex... You had three sex scenes in your film. Mm. How did you prepare the actors? Did you rehearse? Did you choreograph? Was it collaborative? Yeah, yeah. We had a lot of discussion around it and what each sex scene, the purpose of it was in the script. We actually had four, five. Um, one that got cut and then one that's actually kind of just shown on a, a phone in the film. Um, for most of them, yeah, we did. We talked about them a lot in rehearsals. We kind of blocked them out very technically, just, you know, with clothes on, obviously, and just saying these are the, sort, these are the angles we're going to be using, these are... It was Yeah, it was like, you know, almost like drawing diagrams so that everyone kind of knew what to expect and felt really prepared and everyone was comfortable. Um, with the one that is shown just briefly in the film on a phone, we actually shot that and it was a difficult one because it was it's like a scene at a party where there's a few people involved in a, a kind of group sex scenario. And we shot that and, and because the people that were playing the roles were essentially kind of featured extras. On the day, it just went terribly wrong. They, f they were not comfortable even sort of having a shirt off. So oh in the end, we had to reshoot that um, with pickups. And because it had been so hard the first time, we discussed it and we thought that the best way to approach it was to um, use some actors who were from the erotic entertainment industry. So we actually found some people um, through mutual friends who were from that industry from sort of like escort and um, porn industry essentially and used them but that which you know worked better because they were people who were used to having their clothes off on camera but funnily enough they they also felt slightly uncomfortable they said this is not what it's usually like all the stopping and starting they're usually like <laughs> you just go and you just go all the way through <laughs> and uh and there's no cut and action cut and action so they actually found that you know they they, they dealt with it fine and it worked but um they found that so kind of with unusual. that interesting learning, how would you, would you, how would you tackle an, a scene like that in the future? Would you, would you go straight to the erotic actors again and would you maybe go for a continuous really long time? <laughs> Possibly. I mean, I mean, the difficulty in that situation was, as I said, that these weren't the lead actors. So I think when you've got a sex scene that's involving some of the lead actors, then you've got that time with them to rehearse and to, for everyone to be build comfortable trust. with each other, to yeah. build trust. But when it's... Yeah, it was a really hard one. I don't know. I have to reflect on what the yeah. lessons from that were. Interesting. Sarah, um, it strikes me that as an actor, there's two layers of kind of vulnerability. Uh, there's actually being on set and perhaps being naked and perhaps doing a sex scene. And then there's also that um, whatever is recorded can go end up on the big screen. You don't, mm. have, you, you don't always have a right of sign-off on a, on a cut. How do you find... How do you... I guess, empower yourself or protect yourself so that you are coming from a place of strength when you're on set shooting something like this? Um, yeah, I, I think you've just made me think that I think there are some people who can write into a contract the sign-off on cut if on the sex scene, mm. which um, is a way to empower yourself and have a, more control over something that's very intimate. Um, I know that when I have... The first one I ever did on Not Suitable for Children... Um, Ryan Quantum was really great because he had done so many on True Blood uh, that he sort of was very schooled in that sort of realm. And um, after every take, he was like, I know this is really awkward and probably very weird for you, but we can actually... We do, you do have the right to review the split and to review the footage that they're capturing and encourage me to do so so that, you know, we, you know what you look like. You know what the, the shot is. You know exactly how the DOP is covering it and what the lighting's doing and what you need to do to protect yourself physically in a visual sense uh, from showing too much, showing too little, just so you're across it, uh, which was really good to, to, to know that. Um, and in terms of, like, uh, the... I mean, it's just an awkward thing, really, like, because the whole point, really, I guess, of sex is to lose yourself. You're not performing, and, I, you know, there's a sense, I guess, in the mm. pornography industry that's making it more of a performance, that sex is a performance, but it's not. It's, it's the loss of yourself within another person, which is great. Uh, so the strangest thing then is to have a bunch of people watching you do that, and then not only do that, then you become exceptionally self-conscious of like, you don't want to know what you look like in that moment. You wanted, that's the <laughs> whole point, to get rid of that idea of what you look like. Um, and then to have that then seen on camera and to, you know, there's the, there's the desire to want to look beautiful or sexy or whatever because of your fucking ego. But, um, 
one of the one of the best examples I saw recently of sex on screen was in Jill Soloway's I Love Dick. Um, I don't know if anyone here has seen that. Really recommend it. It's really great. And if you are, I mean, if you're here at a sex on screen panel, you'd probably be interested in it. Tell us, um, a, bit, tell us a little bit about it. For, for those it's, it's, it's about a couple who moved to Martha in Texas and they, uh, one is it, it, to, to do an artist res, res, residency. And um, through the woman's, cr- Catherine Hahn's crush on Kevin Bacon's character, their sex life is reignited and you know, then the story continues. But the sex between the husband and wife, Catherine Hahn and Griffin Dunn, is so realistic and natural and sexy and awkward and weird and it, it, it sort of covers all the bases in a... It's, it's full on as well as in that sort of European reality cinema way, but it's not... It does, never feels exploitative and never feels um, too excessive. It feels, again, like it's pushing the narrative forward that... Uh, these two people are very comfortable in in all the lumps and bumps and awkwardnesses of their bodies and that they have a real friendship and intimacy, not just as characters you can see as as actors. And I feel like that's come through the respect that the director has had for the actors doing what they are doing and giving her what they're giving on screen. And it's interesting, isn't it, because uh, I think traditionally we think of America as being, having this very formula, formulaic approach, but there is this real indie kind of mm. current of awesomeness, right? Yeah, definitely. And, and it's still, you know, like the visual of it is still sort of glossy candy, but it's not so much so that it's alienating and not real. Yeah, right. Um, Tony, we, when we were talking the other day about this subject, you, you talked about the importance of subtext in a sex scene. Can you talk a bit about that? I, I think that um, every action in cinema or every action in dramatic storytelling uh, has to be about something else. You know, like, it's what peop- what the characters say and do is not necessarily the meaning of it, and that's what creates subtext. And for me, um, sex scenes are most interesting when they're about something other than sex. When they're... I mean, a, a great show for that is The Americans, uh, which is, yes. you know... The, well, so, so, some some of the meanings of the sex scenes. I mean, the sex scenes and the, they very rarely mean anything else. Because I mean, the context of it is that these are two Rus- two Russian spies who uh, play a married couple, but as part of their work as spies, they have to go off and fuck other people sometimes. <laughs> and so, <laughs> when they get back together as a married couple and have a sex scene after they both know that. The husband has got, is having a deliberate affair with a woman who works for the FBI. The sex scene is so loaded and so Weird. incredible, <laughs> and that's and for me that that's when the sex scene comes alive. And 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 when it's not alive, I mean, because I read a lot of scripts for my work, and you know the sex scene, sex scene is going to be a bit of a dud uh, when you see in, in it. And they have sex. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, and I can't tell you how often I read that. Really? You know, they get together and they have sex. That's the one line. <laughs> because actually it's got to be about something else. It's got to be about, you know, the power and dynamic in the relationship. It has to be about uh, other kinds of feelings, about their sense of who they are. Uh, it, it's got, you know... The more loaded it is for me, the more interesting it is. Otherwise, you know, it's just a little time out. Well, you, you know, really, you're better well, off watching porn. Worst, worst thing it can, yeah, you, definitely. The, the, the worst thing, the worst thing it can possibly be is something to keep people interested. It's yeah, so yeah. cynical. It's the same mm-hmm. as shooting someone in the fucking head with a gun in a film, which is just yeah. like, oh, for God's sake! Again, like, we haven't yeah. seen enough violence. In, you know, <laughs> yeah. see violence in the paper every day. Why don't we be entertained by by some random act of violence just to k- keep us engaged? You know, mm-hmm. um, and I think the same goes for sex scenes. When it's just a cynical thing to sort of like, right, you know. Grab the audience back for a second. Grab their attention back for a moment. Unfortunately, it's almost always. Yep, just show a pair of tits. We'll keep them watching. Yeah, that's right. Rather than <laughs> yeah, anything right. else, right. Like, yeah. or a bum in a g-string, or it's the like bum. the women's uh, bodies are objectified in that to keep to keep the interest and to keep the people watching. Yeah, you don't see a lot of sort of dick on TV in that context, <laughs> do you? Just you know, here's a quick bit of dick to keep you engaged. <laughs> Which probably would be more engaging because you don't see it very right. often. Oh. It's missing from TV right now. 
<laughs> so Miranda, tell me, does your script say, and then they have sex? <laughs> <laughs> no. What does it say? What should it look like on the page? What should writers be writing? Well, I think, uh, gosh, I can't remember what the, how the script went now, but I think it needs to go into some detail that, as Tony said, then sort of betrays what's underlying the act and what, what the true meaning of the scene is. So are you talking about what's happening psychology, psychologically in those characters or should that be Im implicit? I think that should be implicit in yeah. the actions. Yeah. yeah. And tell me, tell me about your favourite... What, what's a memorable sex scene for you on screen? Oh, I always think about the sex scene in Red Road... You guys remember that in Andrea Arnold's oh, first film? Oh yeah, that film. was incredible. Yeah, and tell us about that. That For felt those who haven't really seen the film. authentic. I feel like I can't really tell the context of it yeah. because if people uh, haven't seen it, we'll give the whole. No, anyway, it's a it's a it's a, it's a one night stand. Give it away. And, Go on. <laughs> <laughs> and what you later find out is that this is the man that has accidentally killed her um, husband and child in a hit and run oh. and she's kind of stalking him and th that, but you don't know mm. that at the time but you know that there's this really odd sort of disconcerting alarming relationship between them and, and it's a one night stand and it's just so authentic I mean it, it seems like real sex but I think both of the actors were relatively unknown at the time and they obviously yeah. had a real trust on set and it's just it's a scene that just feels so authentic and and a bit Raw and brutal and ugly, but also sexy. It's yeah, it's um. It's it, I think it seems like real sex because you see his heart on. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah that's and a good so point. you know, you never you, you never see that in films. Yeah. Very rarely. Yeah. Under the skin, fantastic. Oh, Not yeah, a sex yeah. scene, but sometimes no sex is fantastic mm. sex. Actually, yeah. in Elena <laughs> Elena Lodkin's um, film Strange Colors, which played last night, it's playing tomorrow. And if any of you uh, haven't seen it, I. In really very seriously encourage you to go and see the film because um, I'm about to give away something, um, <laughs> which is that they don't have sex. They don't have sex and nobody dies and it's the tension that either of those things could happen that kind of provides a little, like, ticking clock on the wall, you know, in the film. Um, just keeps, you know, a certain amount of engagement, a certain amount of threat and atmosphere, you know, um, mm. in, in the film. And, and under the skin, you know, that extraordinary... Jonathan Glazer film with Scarlett Johansson him probably plays an angel driving around in a van in Glasgow um, to seduce men and and bring them into some sort of black lake that liquefies them for some alien purpose. <laughs> I don't know why, um, but you see those men walking along with their hard-ons into the <laughs> into the black lake. It's yeah. spectacular. Fabulous. Sarah, you have been doing some viewing at the festival this week, and you you were telling me about a, a film you saw which had a really interesting scene. A sex scene? Yeah, Alanis. I don't know if anyone here saw it, but it's a it's a film about a prostitute, and um, uh, she in I think it's an Argentinian film, but um, basically premise the in in Argentina, if it is Argentina, the South American country, um, brothels are illegal, but prostitution isn't. Which I think is really kind of um, oh, perverse. That's weird. Yeah, you'd think that brothels. Would, Offer more protection, um, but <laughs> that's um, not the case. Uh, so, but the sex scene that she sh sort of, you expect her to engage in a sex scene at some point because she is a prostitute and that, you know, she does need to find some money and that is the way that she ends up. She is a cleaner for a couple of uh, moments, a couple of, a day or so, and then goes back to prostitution. Um, but she never, in, I was really interested by the, the confronting. I guess, dialogue and the confronting nature of the scene because it, it was consensual in that she was being paid for it, but you clearly understand that she wasn't necessarily enjoying it and becoming not distressed but pissed off during the scene. And yet n at no point did she manage to lose through the director's um, setups, the shots, what have you, never lost any power. And I thought that was a really interesting way to... Um, just it's just unusual, I guess, because this the, you know, the situation is that she's being taken from behind uh, by the man, and he's being quite aggressive to her and saying, "You know, call me names, blah blah blah, you slut, you whore," calling her names. And but the way that she responds is not not to give him exactly what he wanted or needed, but just to be quite monotone. And he 
maybe you know the in, in, in inference in the in the dialogue you can't understand because I don't speak Spanish but in in the subtitles you hear him really enjoying it and see him in his dialogues seem to be really enjoying it but you never leave her face and never lose uh, connection with her and her feelings about this because she never seems to fully or totally succumb to what he is demanding of her I think that's a really tricky thing to do particularly with a shot like that, because it's her face here and you see her movement, the rhythm constantly. And yeah, I just was really impressed by that, that such I never amazing, felt uncomfortable. Such an amazing thing to honour, just this idea of what's going on in her head. Totally. And kind of by virtue of the idea of that shot too, is that by focusing on the face, you're separating the the images in the mind from the from the body totally too. So it's it's almost like a it's it's a, it's a, a disconnection and an emotional yeah. moment. Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. And it wasn't ever sexualized in that you weren't, you didn't feel voyeuristic in that way. You felt, um, or complicit, I guess, because of your voyeurism. You felt um, an empathy for her. They shot With it through a wind, they shot it through a reflection of a mirror. So there was another dissociation. It's just really clever, really simple, clever filmmaking. So it was obviously uncomfortable. Was it funny as well? I've, uh, yeah, because it goes for so long. That you're <laughs> watching it and you go, oh, oh, uncomfortable. And then because it keeps going and she just, goes into this monotone but that isn't 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 so monotone that you're like well she's being raped it's monotone that she's like i'm just getting through my day my business <laughs> this is this is my work and it fucking sucks excuse me i'm swearing a lot um but the, that you you empathize with that you're like well yeah i hate my job too sometimes but i don't that's not that's not my job mm. but uh yeah it, it was a real uh sensitive way and a, and a confronting way to shoot the scene it seems like that's really the conversation now about cinema, though, isn't it? When we all talk about what's it doing, what's it doing for narrative, what's the perspective, mm. that it's just not enough to just sort of just sh to just show it by rote, as you mm. said, by those four shots. It's like there's so much more opportunity for investigation mm. and for kind of deep thought about what what this does to us. Because that, that's what I realised making this film, actually, is that you know, that, that narrative is not events that occur. Narrative is how those events affect people. Yes. Mm. It's, not, it's not a chain of events. It's what's the flicker of the moment afterward or, or the perspective that comes to the incident that tells us what it's doing to people. And one of the effects that some that sex scenes can have when they're done in a, in a way that's outside of the traditional formula is to create a sense of shock or transgression and that, that can be a very potent effect on an audience. Can, it can um, sort of take, take away some of your barriers. Uh, I, I remember um, the opening scene of Betty Blue, and there's this long mm -hmm. sex scene in it. And I, I went there with... It's was, quite explicit, isn't it, it? Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, you know... Yeah, yeah, French. it's it's Quite it's French. serious, it's serious, <laughs> but it but the the thing in particular that it did was it just went on and on and on, and it made me aware at the time. Apart from the 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 paradox of feeling aroused in the public space where you shouldn't be, you know, there was that. <laughs> there was a, a, a the feeling of being really uncomfortable with the you know. You know, I went with some friends and, you know, that's not what you do with those friends. You have dinner, you talk about things, you know, and and the fact that it just broke every formula for how, you know, and made me aware, oh, I'm just used to seeing sex in a certain way. So it it is a comfortable way. And this was sex as discomfort. And I thought that, for instance, was a, a very effective sex scene because it sort of affected me. Outside of Top of the Lake and even... Irrespective of that or my involvement of that, I think the the Jane is just the apex of that in mm. our cinema. And one particular story, just in terms of discomfort, was I um I loved the piano when I was about whatever I was fourteen years old. I think when I saw the piano and I was completely obsessed by this film. And the sexuality in that film is extraordinary. The language of their sexuality and what it has to say about the knowledge of sex for people at that time. Uh, when in this kind of Puritan mould where people wouldn't have actually ever been told what it was and Sam Neill, his character, has to discover it by watching this other man explore sex with his wife. 
he, he and it's just so confronting. But because I loved it so much, I was desperate to see Holy Smoke when it came out. I was about 16 <laughs> years old and I took my mum. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you have seen Holy Smoke, but I remember distinctly sitting there at 16 years old. I don't know whether or not I had a heart on at this point. I was so... But Kate Winslet pisses on herself in the desert <laughs> to seduce... Harvey Keitel, she's naked, she pisses on herself and then it just cuts to his ass, just <laughs> fucking from behind and her yelling, don't come, don't come and him going, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I could have yeah, melted. Things not to do with your mother. <laughs> just don't do that with your mum. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, teenage years aside, um, you guys are all sounding like a very um, accomplished Experts, but obviously we all start as amateurs. So I'm interested to hear about the the cringe moments or the the, the awkwardness or difficulties of directing sex scenes, maybe early on. I know Tony. I think you had a good story there. Okay. Um, <laughs> I made a film called Home Song Stories in 2006, and you know had one of the most beautiful, and it was autobiographical, and I had one of the most beautiful women in the world playing my mother, Joan Chan, and I had this phenomenal, um, and phenomenally handsome uh, uh, Singaporean actor, Chi Yu Wu, playing her lover at the time, and there was one, one sex scene, and um, Joan was a real trooper. She, she but what I, I hadn't realised is that Singaporean actors just, like, they, they never do sex scenes, you know, like, it's, it's, they, it's just not part of the cinema vernacular in Singapore. They don't do nude scenes. In fact, uh, the, the big, the, the film released in Singapore and the big sell, the marketing sell was uh, Singaporean actor does a nude scene. Oh. <laughs> that, 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 that was the, but right. anyway, I was, I was directing this scene, it was in a car, uh, Joan was on top, she was doing her level best to make it work, he was kind of awkward, but you know, incredibly beautiful. And halfway through the scene, I realised I'm directing my mother to have sex. <laughs> and, uh, and instead of saying cut, I just said stop. <laughs> and we just did one take. <laughs> but that, was that... it actually, like, outside, was it actually a kind of moment of horror? Like, almost a... No, no, uh, it's just one of those moments where I suddenly thought, you know, this is what I'm doing. I can't, I can't do this. That's why I stopped. And we, you know, we made it work with what we had. <laughs> like sex, it's just about communication and really clear communication and not feeling like you're going to feel like a fool by speaking. It's better to speak and say it, I think. Um, you know, is it... I think, you know, it's funny because the subtext of this whole conversation... Uh, is also we're aware that we're talking in a climate where, you know, sex, sex culture, stuff around film has sort of, in a really amazing way, sort of shattered the global landscape of how we think about this stuff at the moment. So I think that sort of transparency and that sort of um, thoughtfulness is, mm. is really important. Just as a quick thing that might help, um, hands are very intimate. And I know that um, mm -hmm. as a get to know you sort of sequence, I think the dinner thing is a great idea, but then perhaps on set, if you have the time or rehearsal, there's an exercise you can do where you sit opposite your fellow actor and uh, your hands communicate and that's it. You can't look at each other in the eye or you, you ask them not to look at each other in the eye and then you just allow your hands to sit like this and then at some point they talk, like you just move them to go towards each other. And what it does is create a really foundational and true, authentic intimacy. It, it can be very intimate, which is why I would recommend yeah. not looking them in the eye That's or them looking at each other in the eye. I know Jennifer Kent, uh, who just made The Nightingale, which is about to play in competition at Venice, she talked about working with that process a lot with some really tough material that's in The Nightingale, really tough stuff. With the hand exercise. Yep. Oh, love that. There's an um, interesting documentary, three-part documentary that some of us watched, I only watched two episodes, um, called Indie Sex. And what, what's interesting about that, that I sort of 
came to and, and found most interesting is that how sex has been approached in the media throughout the last hundred years, really. And and it has actually gone from being quite conservative to being very liberal to then being very conservative again and coy and then being liberal and explicit. And it, it sort of goes in stages. And it was interesting for me looking back and seeing they, they sort of chart on a timeline and when they came in for certain films like American Pie, how old I was, looking at how old I was when I saw that or when that sort of approached the cinema and thinking, oh, that actually did set up sort of some things in my brain about how I perceive men in the world and how I perceive men enjoy sex or what they expect from sex or oral sex, as you say. And then, and also then, what was the other one? Uh, you know, then it leads into like Princess Diaries and that kind of like very romanticized version of what love or intimacy is. And it is interesting what you say because I think we do get so much of our information from the media and what the media, what the popular media is at the time. And I think now, yeah, the challenge is that uh, <laughs> because there's so much media and information available to young people on the internet that it's it's probably up to us as filmmakers to create something that is a lot more authentic and honest and is a more balanced view of what we hope a more uh, a happier sexual relationship would be with yourself and with the person that you choose to do that with. It's it's tragic what young men are fed. Yeah. I think and it causes just so much devastation um, in this society, um, the way that sort of stuff is imparted. And that's why I brought up that film Hail before, because I think, you know, no young man is ready to absorb that yet. I don't know how you counter that stuff and I don't know how you approach that sort of stuff. But if you could get them to understand what's going on between those two people in Hale, um, I think that would just be spectacular for the, the whole society. But the thing that Sarah was saying earlier, which I re really connected to, is that in spite of all the representations of sex throughout our history, so rarely do you actually get a feeling of the, the truth of sex, the, the messy, gritty reality of sex. Like, so, it's so rare that you get, mm. you know, what actually happens to the sperm, you know, like what, you know, like, <laughs> you know, the, yeah. the, you know, you know the, the, like, you, you know, the, the, the visceral, the true viscera of sex. And, and I, so I think there's, weirdly enough, a lot still to be, somehow represented or dealt with uh, in how, how we talk about sex. I think the material's gonna guide you there, you know. I think in terms of what you select to deal with, just in terms of the actual subject matter, that's gonna guide you to necessarily who's it depicting, who's it talking about, and what sort of sex you're gonna see. You know, as I said in my first film, you know, I'm, I'm directing a gay, sex scene between two young men and the reason for that and the reason for dealing with that was because as I said I felt it was necessary for the context of the film and but also actually the consequence of it and the meaning of it was that that one of them was using the other that it's a film about a theft it's a film about theft in relationships um, and journalism as theft and art as theft and certainly cinema also um, that's part of it um, so that l led me to uh, you know, to try to show as authentically as I as I could, you know, a, a sexual scene between two men. And again, I have no experience of that. I think it is absolutely important because, as we've been saying, that's where, you know, we all start as amateurs. Like, you're all sort of, we're all fumbling around in the dark. Um, and the only real way as humans to learn about sex is to either engage with it and do it yourself or watch it on screen. And I think... That, to, to, to have diversity in the types of sex, in the types of people who engage in sex, in racial diversity, like, you know, everything. And Every, body types. Yeah. Body, body types. types. That's, just, that's the big taboo. Types, you know, you just don't see people of certain body types have sex. Absolutely. That, that it's that then there's just more material that is accessible to people as teenagers, as amateurs, as people who are maybe not so confident with their body type or what their sexuality yeah. even to go, oh, okay, here's a little blueprint, let me try that, to feel a little more confident, a little safer in the world, I guess. So, yeah, absolutely. Is there also an opportunity for writers to not default to 
beautiful white people <laughs> and, yeah. and, and directors to not direct default to beautiful white people. Yeah, absolutely. When but, again, cast but again, that's the material. That's yeah. the material that you exactly. choose to deal with, um, you know, um, to, to, I think, to insist on that sort of thing purely in terms of sex, almost like treating it like an island within the film, mm. I think would not be the right way to approach that, but it would be the Part source of, of the material yeah. and the diversity of the material itself. Yeah. Okay, Which, Tony, you've created an enormous amount of work like that, like dealing with people from all backgrounds. I mean, even in something like The Slap, you know. It's yeah, yeah. It, I mean, I, I do think it's the responsibility of the maker, you know. You, so to, to... And it's your personal investment in those sort of stories, you know, that, that will facilitate... So I would just say, make the story yourself. You know, the, make the story you want to see. I think it's really a last caution, which is Ang Lee's film that went on to win the Palme That's incredible. It's, yeah. inc it's, it's astonishing. Film. If any yeah. of you haven't seen that film, I would urge you to go out and watch Last Caution. As I said, an absolutely horrible end to that film, I think, personally, yeah. that shouldn't, that should be, should, the last 10 minutes should just be cut off. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the, but the, but the, 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 the storytelling through the sex, the physicality of the sex, and isn't it, I don't know if you remember this, Tony, but there's a look on Tony Leung's face when this very timid, a uh, young woman who's joined this sort of revolutionary group in their first sex scene, and it is just so wild and so physical. And there's this, and I'm sure, as I said, I'm sure it's real. And there's this look of absolute shock that comes over him that he's sort of confronting this um, force. I mean, that's that's a pretty mainstream filmmaker uh, choosing to tell a story um, that way. I don't think studios would let you do that stuff. I mean, you're certainly not going to see it in a Marvel film. So that'd be amazing <laughs> with superpowers. Oh, except Kate Shortland's directing one. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I, I, think gonna, I think you're going to see a lot in Black Widow. Oh, Black Widow. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. I would also say with, like, with, with, on that, like with the studios, so often so many people are getting a pass at, at the final cut and the edit and approval over that look. And, and what Tom was saying about um, you know, the conversation being shattered at the moment around sexuality and, and sex on film and gender, just, you know, just, just that huge conversation that's going on now, I, I would hope that that is changing, but so much uh, in recent history has been dictated by heterosexual white men. And so... It's the lens, isn't it? It's, it's the it, lens that... Uh, uh, that uh, and so, so what you're getting is a very watered down, very usually female objectified uh, in mainstream cinema. Well, one of the things we haven't even touched upon, which will be maybe another hour somewhere else, <laughs> I mean, is the, the whole uh, mystification of the phallus and the fact that the phallus is never represented in sex and that, that, that there... And the, the, the kind of relationship between that and power and patriarchy, because I think there is a, a clear line about... Because you hold power maybe, when you yeah. you hold power when you don't show. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there other is there a double standard there when you're dealing with broadcasters Absolutely. when you're dealing with distributors? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, literally, that would be that would, a, that would be down to the to, down to the uh, the contracts and that sort of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I mean, I got uh, it was for a show that I'm doing now. Uh, I didn't have a flight booked on my way to the airport to fly within an hour if I hadn't signed the contract soon, when they called at the 11th hour to say, oh, well, just nudity clause. Can we put a nudity clause in so that we could allow to show your tits and ass if we want to at some point? And I just went, no, I'm just not getting on the plane. I'm not going to put that in. If you're going to ask, if you had asked me, a, if you had approached me a week earlier, even we could discuss this, but no, absolutely not. You said no? Yeah. And you're doing the show? Bravo. Fucking awesome. Yeah, Bravo. because... That's great. <laughs> And I am more than... I'm not a prude. I have done sex scenes before. I'm more than willing to talk about it with a director on the day and if it's, if it's narratively necessary for the script. But it's a, with a company that's known for its uh, unjudicious use of TNA and not very much use of full frontal male nudity. And DNA. <laughs> <laughs> you know. T and A. Um, <laughs> you know, like, they've got enough uh, without yeah. mine. It's really touchy, this sort of stuff. But that, that issue of male insecurity and male weakness, perceived weakness and that sort of mm -hmm. stuff, is so cancerous. We were just talking about this before. In so many levels of society, but certainly on film sets, I have a former partner of mine who was filming a scene, major network in Australia, and uh, sex scenes, and the guys that were working with her decided that they needed to, you know, stay cool, you know, 
stay cool, don't give away too much, you know, um, hold on to the power. And as a result, uh, sh- you know, it was totally shit traumatic experience for her and she ended up on the front page of the paper and they're damn lucky she hasn't spoken their names, you know. Um, it, you know, the, just this quality of respect and care for one another, that's it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Sarah, do you have anything, any final words in terms of what we, anything you would like directors, particularly new directors, to think about when they approach this kind of situation? Oh, um, I liked what, what you were saying before, Tony, about allowing the actors to sort of direct it. And I think the problem with that, the, the, the um, initial problem with that that um, I know that I would come up against is <laughs> talking to someone who you've maybe met three weeks before, three days before, possibly even three hours before, and then you have to simulate an intense relationship a very intimate relationship. Perhaps you've been married for 20 years. Perhaps you've only just met. Who knows? But either way, it's very exposing, very vulnerable, very raw. And the difficulty I know in the initial to go, well, let's direct it ourselves, is that you don't want to be like, oh, what if I yeah, put my hand yeah, here? Yeah. Is that okay with you? Do you, you know, what is that sexy? It, so I think what um, this gentleman down here is doing in terms of allowing the actors to get to know each other in a safe space without pressure, without um, <coughs> pressure of time or any of that because so much about uh, a set <laughs> is time and you don't get a lot of that at all and then to waste it on on the actors getting to know each other it can be it can you know as an actor you feel like well quick gotta jump in gotta learn quickly um however i think that that is a great sort of once you can get that intimacy and respect mutual respect and consensual agreement to to know how to engage with each other's bodies then to be able to direct yourself with the director in hand is is probably the best way to approach it awesome. and it's also like you know there's a lot of talk about these days just returning to that too there's a lot of talk about treating it like fight choreography too you know making sure you do it beforehand just so people are safe or really dance. going through it or dance yeah. mm. and treat it like that yeah and, and, and make it clear to them that they, they're not required to, to, to bring, you know, emotion uh, necessarily to it unless you're going to re- rehearse that very carefully, you know. Yeah, um, I, I've, I've been in, um, on a set once where I w- didn't have a responsibility as actor or crew and so I had... The, I was available, I guess, in that sense. And uh, there was quite a violent um, sexual act being perpetrated on screen. And the young boy who was involved with that found it very troubling and traumatic. And I felt that it was difficult for the filmmakers at large to be able to help him because they just had to get on with the work they were doing. And it was difficult and traumatic for everybody to watch, but they're able to deal with it in a different way. They're able to very easily separate arm's length, turn around, not engage. Um, So just as a, this is just as a practical trick if you are directors or actors, doing something that will uh, allow your body to acknowledge the unreality of the situation is really helpful. So even just sitting in a moment of silence with someone not asking how you feel, are you okay, blah, 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 just sitting and having some camaraderie with someone in a moment of silence and going, okay, you could just, if, if it's physical, then you can, there's a way you can like rhythmically pat your body down and go, okay, this is a reality now. What was before is no longer a reality and you're changing the physical shape and nature of your body in that moment. That's just a practical way of dealing with it. But I think in terms of the crew now, I've never had to deal with a serious scene of sexual violence, but I think that's, that's absolutely right. I think that accountability to everybody that you're working with is really important. Again, it's communication with everyone. I think it'd be having to make sure everybody was looked after and not only the actors but everybody but also just practically when you shoot sex scenes on film bizarrely because everyone's going to see it in the movie but but to support everybody it's not bizarre at all it's it's important it's it's usually what we call a closed set so it'll just be dop first ac focus puller um director of photography and the focus puller sound recordist, unless they even place a mic. Sometimes you can place a mic and record with a remote mic and the director and the actors. And that's all you require. And sometimes there'll be somebody from wardrobe standing there holding, standing there pushed against a wall like this, holding a dressing gown so they can run in and throw it on them the minute you call cut. 
Um, just, yeah, it's what you said before about trust and respect to everyone involved and, you know, whether it's a scene of, you know, sexual love or sexual violence, I think making sure that everyone, you know, feels as safe and comfortable and, and that there's honest discussion around it so that people feel respected and people feel... I mean, even to the point of saying, if you feel uncomfortable, if anyone in the crew feels uncomfortable, please, you know, go and step outside and, and um, you know, sit down and have a cup of tea. But also, I guess, like, facing the... In terms of, like, a, a depiction of sexual violence on screen, facing the nature of that and going, if you are putting it into screen anyway, you're making it a reality in some person's life as an actor who has to p- perpetrate it to another person, and that could be just as difficult as having it happen to you as an actor. Um, and that really we should be discussing these kinds of things anyway, that it's, it, it would be a disservice to us as a human <laughs> group of people, a society to go, oh, yeah, we're just going to quickly shoot this uh, rape scene and this sexual assault scene, and then we'll just move on and get ready for the next one because uh, we've got to get lunch. That's, I, I, that's I think not it's the probably, purpose. if you're going to do that, it's, you just have to be so choreographed in the way you yeah. do it. You have to be so yeah. mechanical and break it down so it doesn't feel real. I had, I had to do a scene once where it was... Uh, an attempted rape and afterwards I mean the actress you know we just broke it down to each exactly what movement was each thing was and she felt safe but the actor afterwards had to go into the toilet and cry he was so upset by having to do that and um, you know so we had to spend a lot of time talking about it afterwards and also you don't want to have to share if you have had experience of sexual violence in your own life you don't want to have to share Uh, that past just because it is your job in this moment to portray that again but creating a safe space that allows um very detailed precision and and exposure within a safe space is just paramount i think I think that is a perfect moment for us to wrap up this very interesting conversation. May it be the first of many. Thank you, guys. It's been fascinating talking to you all. Thank you for your questions and for your attention. And enjoy the rest of the festival. We love Mif. And I forgot... And thanks, Beck. Thank you. Thank you.